Happy November 5th, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jay Michaels, and we're here at the fourth folio. Now, the fourth folio is our program in which we discuss William Shakespeare, whomever he may be. We're going to discuss the authorship question with celebrity guests, and uh, uh, we're going to discuss basically the foundations of Shakespeare's plays, and uh, then uh, my, my co-host Rodney Hakim and I will, will have a deep and meaningful chat <laughs> where, where we will discuss uh, uh, exactly whether we think Shakespeare wrote the play or not. In other words, Rodney's president, and I am telling you that I actually have Pennsylvania. See, that's how that's going to go. <laughs> what a what? wonderful tie-in to the uh, Thank you. Tournament. Yes, there you go. I think I took the wrong party for myself. But nonetheless, um, <laughs> we're, we're really thrilled to have with us Cassidy Cash. Uh, I'm, I'm intimidated. She, uh, she, has, uh, she has her own podcast regarding Shakespeare and has it for many years now. And she's an authority on the Bard. And so, so I, I better listen closely because, <laughs> uh, because here's someone with great intellect regarding the topic. Uh, I, I introduce my co-host who will uh, introduce our guest, Rodney, take it away. So hello, Jay. Thank you for uh, that lovely introduction. And, and before I get to Cassidy, why don't I just mention for anyone who might be uh, viewing this program for the first time, although it'll be airing on uh, your channels, the Jay Michaels Communications channels. So I'm sure you have your audience built into there, but we'll also be airing this on the New York Shakespeare social media. And there might be some people on there that are unfamiliar with your work. Jay Michaels, uh, for those who do not know him, is a veteran of the theater scene, of theater and film. And Jay and I worked together for many years in the New York scene. We uh, worked together as part of the Genesis Repertory Ensemble and other outfits thereafter. And uh, he and I, one of, one of my favorite memories of working in the New York theater scene was uh, the work that Jay and I did. Uh, we worked together on a series called the Fourth Folio Series, which is what we're uh, reprising with this online series now. And in that series, we went through each of Shakespeare's plays gave it a theatrical performance, and then followed up with questions and answers at the audience and discussed at that time the Shakespeare authorship question. And now we're trying to bring that same mentality or that same uh, investigative spirit into this online series. So Jay is someone who's done a tremendous amount of work on Shakespeare, both theatrically and uh, in, uh, on screen. You've done a number of uh, film adaptations and more recently, Jay, you've delved into another area that is near and dear to tonight's discussion, which is that of terror. You are uh, the host of Terror TV. Uh, you have, uh, you've always had a fascination with the Grand Guignol and the, uh, the Macabre. I remember we did a production of uh, The Spanish Tragedy. Uh, and you did that in a very uh, bizarre Grand Guignol uh, format, but it was, it was fantastic. It was, it was it sort was of a hybrid memorable. between my, my homage to Teatro du Grand Guignol and Hammer Films from the United right. Kingdom. Right. So, so Jay is a veteran of the scene and someone who's very accomplished uh, in presenting Shakespeare in a multitude of formats. Uh, I myself, my name is Rodney Hakim. I am the voice behind the New York Shakespeare social media feeds. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. And uh, what I try to do is I try to uh, keep it tabs on everything that's happening in the New York Shakespeare scene, from theatrical performances to book readings to uh, film screenings to uh, everything else that you can get your hands on. And you can find all that content on New York Shakespeare on social media. And uh, one He's of the things- very kind, by the way. <laughs> He's, One of the things that that I always enjoy. Go ahead, Jay. I, I don't he's making he's making it like he's just this nice guy who watches other people's work. <laughs> uh, in working with Rodney, the one thing which I can remember sitting in the back of the house watching his production of Taming of the Shrew and his analysis of the simple line Christopher Sly in <laughs> uh, in the opening section of. Taming of the Shrew. And at that point, right. I realized just simply how brilliant he is and oh, how astute you. he is within the text. So if we're talking Shakespeare authority, again, I'm sitting back here like this because I <laughs> defer to those who are far more astute and he is certainly one of them. That's very kind of you. Thank you, Jay. The, the, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> uh, and, and I share that feeling with our, our special guest tonight, and that is Cassidy Cash of that Shakespeare life. I've come across uh, Cassidy on social media and I've been following her for quite a while now. Uh, she has a wonderful uh, website, uh, it's, it's cassidycash.com. 
and she also has that Shakespeare life. It's a podcast. And in her podcast, Cassidy explores in a very uh, charming way, I would say, uh, the, you know, sometimes with, uh, with historians and scholars, the analysis that they bring to Shakespeare can be kind of dry and academic. Uh, and I find that Cassidy's approach is a very different approach. She approaches Shakespeare in a very, um, uh, in a very friendly way, in a very uh, conversational way, and in a way that she explores some of the some of the day to day aspects of Shakespeare's life. Uh, with Shakespeare, uh, I think one of them was Shakespeare. Uh, how did he brush his teeth, and how did his contemporaries? Uh, what what did they use for um, for bathing and things like that? So some some of the you know the day to day things, and she uh, she is very approachable, very uh, uh, has a very very. Uh, conversational way of approaching her, her uh, subject matter. Was so, so I'm very excited that Cassidy is joining us here tonight. Cassidy, uh, you're down in Alabama, but uh, we're, we're uh, connected here by Zoom here tonight. So we're, it's a pleasure to have you join us tonight. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Okay, so uh, the reason that we are having Cassidy join us tonight and, and connecting back to the, uh, the discussion of Jay and his work with Terror and the Grand Guignol and all that is uh, that tonight's discussion is about one of everyone's favorite of Shakespeare's plays, and that is Macbeth. So in the New York scene, Macbeth was all the rage just a few days ago when it was Halloween, because everyone connects Macbeth to Halloween because of the witches. We all know the three witches, the three weird sisters of uh, Macbeth who promised Macbeth that he will be king, and uh, with their, uh, their confusing and their uh, questionable uh, prophecy, shall you say, uh, Macbeth proceeds to enact this uh, dastardly plan to kill off King Duncan and become the new King of Scotland. And uh, then all of a sudden, uh, all other uh, terrible things befall him uh, as, as that progression goes on. But the reason we connect back to this is that uh, the original connection to to Macbeth is not just about the three witches and it's not just about the blood and the gore and Halloween. There's a much deeper historical connection to that. And Cassidy, why don't you tell us what that connection is and why we're celebrating today on November 5th and what significance that has? Yes, remember, remember the 5th of November. Tonight is the night in England when many people celebrate what's called Bonfire Night. It's also sometimes called Guy Fawkes Day. And basically Guy Fawkes is burned in effigy on this night to remember when he and a bunch of co-conspirators tried to blow up parliament when King James and several of his court were there. It would have been hugely destructive to uh, the nation for this to have occurred and he got caught right as he was about to blow up England's parliament using gunpowder hidden beneath the official government meeting and so this day goes down in history for that reason but this happened when William Shakespeare was almost 40 years old and he was there and his extended family was actually implicated in the plot and Macbeth turns out to be a way that he can prove his loyalty. Hmm. It's okay, ironic so. when you talk about November 5, because contemporary audiences know it for the same reason, thanks to the movie V for Vendetta. <laughs> I was about to say the True. same thing. I, I, think, I think most people in the American audience uh, know Guy Fawkes because of that movie and know that there is the mask and know that he was like a vigilante of sorts. But I don't think they know that the, there's that whole situation with the gunpowder plot. So tell us more about uh, Guy Fawkes and, and what, did, what did this all have to do with, with Shakespeare? You said that Shakespeare was there, his contemporaries were there. What did this all have to do with, with Shakespeare? Sure, well, in terms of what it has to do with Shakespeare, he was in a position where he had to really prove that he wasn't someone to be mistrusted. I mean, when you look through the different evidence that exists from history about what was going on, the whole nation was really tense. I mean, the, the best contemporary analogy that I have about this event is got to be 9-11, because it's the same idea of people choosing to do something hugely destructive and an act of terrorism on the basis of religion. And so the gunpowder plotters thought that if they got rid of James, they would get rid of Protestantism and Catholicism could come back to England and, and be restored in a sense. And they wanted to do that. And there was a stronghold of 
what was called Catholic recusants. They were basically closeted Catholics and they lived in Warwickshire, which is where Stratford-upon-Avon or Shakespeare's hometown is. And Shakespeare's extended family and close friends had this established history under Elizabeth I for being involved in these kinds of events. There was a man named Edward Arden, who was a cousin to William Shakespeare, who was actually arrested, tortured, and ultimately executed for his involvement with John Somerville, who tried to assassinate Queen Elizabeth. And so there's let, Shakespeare's- let me, just, uh, Cassie, yeah. let me just hit the pause button for a second. For anyone who might not be following uh, the historical changes there, just, just to give a frame of reference. So we're going from the late 1500s in England, where Queen Elizabeth is the long reigning uh, queen of England. And yeah. we're transitioning into the early 1600s when King James I, her nearest blood relative, who is the King of Scotland, comes and takes over as the King of England, unifying England and Scotland. So uh, that's part of the tension here is the unification of England and Scotland, the new king, uh, King James I being the monarch after a long period of, king, uh, of Queen Elizabeth being the, the regent, being the queen. And uh, then uh, there's this uh, attempt on King James's life. Uh, so go ahead. So you were saying how uh, uh, Shakespeare's extended family factors into it. Go ahead. Yes, at, this was around 1583. So Shakespeare was mm -hmm. around 19 years old. And this is during Shakespeare's lost years. So we don't actually know where Shakespeare was at this time, but mm -hmm. Somerville and Edward Arden had this plot and they were related to Shakespeare by distant cousins. And after, you threw, threw me off pausing. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I apologize. I, apologize. <laughs> I was. Let, okay. Let's take a moment. I'll, I'll, I'll take a moment. I'll, I'll, I'll sidetrack the conversation with Jay while you, while you uh, collect your thoughts. So, Jay, uh, in in your previous work with uh, Macbeth, I know that you've always focused on the um, on the witches and and what what they bring to this story. So, uh, based on what what Cassidy said thus far about how uh, there's this, this tension, there's this, uh, there's this antagonism uh, of, the, uh, of the Protestant minority in England, whereas Catholicism uh, is, I'm sorry, uh, Protestantism is the, is the majority now and Catholicism is outlawed, correct? Or am I, do I have it reversed? Uh, to my knowledge, I, uh, yes, Catholicism is outlawed thanks to Henry VIII. Yes. And we yes. I mean, it's not it's not far off at this time for Catholics to be considered both dangerous and a threat. It's actually illegal to hold this belief. So in a sense, the whole country is you, you either are a Protestant or if you dare like Somerville to step out there and say that you want Catholicism to be the religion of the country, you are running seriously afoul of the established order, which is why even though the stuff with Somerville and Arden occurred under Elizabeth I, it was strongly mm -hmm. remembered and had a lot of parallels in 1605 with the gunpowder plot. And especially for Shakespeare's immediate family, Robert Catesby was one of the participants in the gunpowder plot. And his father, William Catesby, was considered a close friend of John Shakespeare. So there's very personal, very direct connections with Shakespeare himself. And under James I, Shakespeare has just newly achieved the status of the King's Men. It was 1603 when James officially patronized Shakespeare's company. So he's like- That's right, he was the Lord Chamberlain's man. He right. And, the Lord Chamberlain's man and they actually marched in the coronation parade with James I. I mean, he's, he's, James knows who William Shakespeare is and now his extended family has been cast with this enormous shadow. And I think between that and the finding of Catholic papers on, of John Shakespeare and all of these different things that come together, when you look at it as a whole, it's hard to wonder now you know, over 400 years removed from this happening, we still look at it and go, how much did Shakespeare know exactly about the gunpowder plot? Because there's so many places where he was just a hair's breadth away from it. And I think if that's what we think about it from here, it makes complete sense that Shakespeare was feeling a tremendous amount of pressure to do something to declare for his brand new king patron here that hey you know you don't have to worry about me i'm loyal i'm protestant i like go king james you know was macbeth right. is the banner it's, there that he's throwing out there 
it's interesting you 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 bring up two points uh, or, or you bring up a point that that uh, two two points came into my head number one uh we we always associated with halloween but the irony is it's not scary the witches necessarily what what shakespeare did was use pagan myth we have three witches in there the mother the maid the crone there's also a scene that many times is cut out where they summon hecate they don't summon the devil they don't summon a demon they summon hecate another pagan goddess essentially and uh, it might be interesting because maybe if Shakespeare really did, whoever Shakespeare is, uh, wants to uh, uh, impress his king, he did two things. Number one was he likened Christianity to its ancient pagan roots and, and showing how, how uh, the, the problems of the pagan faith in England at the time, thus pushing us toward Protestantism. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the main part of, of connecting King James to this is Banquo, yes? Banquo is supposedly King James' relative, hence the line, uh, uh, you won't be king, but your, your sons will be king. Uh, yes. I mean, that's one of them. There's actually a lot of direct references to King James and Scotland and trying to be there's even a point where he actually writes the symbol that james had after the gunpowder plot uh, resolved james had a coin minted kind of in declaration of th that's over now and shakespeare uses language in the play that references that specific coin design with the serpent on it and everything almost verbatim the line is describing the coin so it's it's very connected to the gunpowder plot and to james oh. the first but yes banquo king james was supposedly descended from the real banquo and so he's right. saying you know your your reign will continue and that's that's the loyalty aspect of this play there's, okay, so there's, there's wonderful some... fake news so many times in, in <laughs> Shakespeare. There's, uh, uh, if you see the movie Anonymous, you see so much of it concerning Richard III. Uh, when you really get down to it, Richard III was a paranoid king with scoliosis, but thanks to Shakespeare, he is, he is the real monster. And, and the notion of Banquo's lineage being King James, we see these little bits of, of how the theater moves history in the direction that it needs to go. So, uh, so Cassidy, coming back to what you're talking about, about how uh, Shakespeare is attempting to uh, mollify or you know, to ameliorate the situation with, with King James I, who has just uh, patronized him, who has just made him uh, the, the royal uh, uh, theater producer, shall we say, you know, with the, being the uh, king, uh, king's men, uh, where he's performing for, for King James at court, as opposed to performing uh, in the theater. Uh, so how does writing this play uh, improve that situation? Is, is, is it just that he's trying to make himself uh, disassociated with the plotters by making uh, King James look uh, heroic? What, what is, what's the intention there? I, I think so. Yes, absolutely. And I don't know if it's possible for me to screen share for you, but I found a picture of the coin that I was telling you about that I can show you if you want okay. me to. Let's yeah, I think if you hit can. share content, that should oh, be there right. you go. Okay, so, and I don't know how big that's showing up on your screen there, but that was actually the silver medal um, struck in Holland in 1605 to commemorate the gunpowder plot. And if you'll see there, it has that serpent with under a flower and mm. Lady Macbeth in the play says it looks like the innocent mm. flower, but you know, look like the innocent okay. flower, but be the serpent under it. And ah. so it's, it's just a direct reference to the gunpowder plot. I mean, he might as well have I've written, you know, I'm talking about <laughs> that event, you know, in there. Okay. And so, I, yeah, I think there was, and I don't, I don't think we can use the word just to describe, you know, was it just Shakespeare trying to prove his loyalty to the king? I mean, there, mm -hmm. there's every reason to think Shakespeare's actual life was in danger if the king were to d be suspicious of him. And he okay. held, he held this prominent position in the court of, well, not royal court, but James knew who he was, was officially patronizing him. It's not like he could hide on the fringe. You know, he's going to see him. He's going to remember him. And it's sure. he's going to go, oh, you know, oh, that's your family that was, you know, tried to kill me. Where do you stand on this? And I, I right. think of things like, you know, when Christopher Marlowe and Thomas Kidd got arrested, Kidd got arrested just because he was friends with somebody that 
had done something wrong. And mm -hmm. I think the close association with someone who got in trouble or ran afoul of the government could be very, very dangerous. Shakespeare had a multitude of reasons to, to want and to be motivated to say, I'm, I'm loyal, I'm not a threat, I am, you know. But I think it also goes to Shakespeare's general style of putting plays together because all of his plays, even under Elizabeth I, he has this trend of tying what he writes back into current events and mm -hmm. tying it very specifically to the audience he's writing for. So I Correct. think it's not, it's probably not completely about Shakespeare personally, but that definitely plays, plays into it. Wasn't and, Thomas and, Kidd? I'm, I'm, I, I, I always remember the, the, the juicy details. Thomas Kidd, wasn't he Christopher Marlowe's lover? Wasn't people, that part of he was people have suggested alleged. that. Alleged, yeah. Yeah. Right. They don't, right. there's not, they were really close friends and they were roommates. Um, there's beyond that, I plead with it. I mean, you I know, mean, there's, there's I saw so much documentary you can with infer the, from. I, I saw a wonderful documentary with Derek Jacobi and they, they did a dramatization and they showed that they, they shared a bed. And I thought, well, if Derek Jacoby says that's the case, then I'm, I'm just <laughs> that's, that's there. good enough for me, right? There you so, go. Uh, Cassidy, uh, in, in what you're talking about uh, just before with the, the connection between uh, Shakespeare and uh, James I and his attempts to uh, assuage a situation and prove uh, his loyalty to the king, uh, what does Shakespeare's own religious stance have to do with all that? Uh, we, we discussed briefly uh, a little bit before that about how the state religion is Protestantism and there's pockets of Catholicism, pockets of paganism. Where, where did Shakespeare stand in all this? And, and how did that factor into all this, the, into the play? I don't think we can... I don't think we can know Shakespeare's heart. So I think I want to give some latitude to the fact that right now everyone in in england needed to be protestant or they would get in trouble so you can't necessarily know the heart of a man and what he believes inwardly versus what he portrays outwardly but in mm -hmm. shakespeare's case every evidence we have of him suggests that he never became a catholic i think he not the least of which is his tremendous and undying dedication to holy trinity church a protestant church in stratford-upon-avon and mm -hmm. you know i think there's room to consider shakespeare might have held other beliefs but there's little in the way of evidence from his life to suggest he was catholic and there's ample evidence to conclude he was protestant now i I don't believe his personal beliefs would have run him afoul of the government. Um, I tend to side with David Bevington on this. He talked with us back in 2018 on that Shakespeare life about Shakespeare's religion and this, this question of was he Catholic or was he Protestant and, and just came to the conclusion that Shakespeare doesn't give any evidence from his life that, that he would have been Catholic. Now, that said, there's a lot of suspicion around his father and his father's friends and definitely there was a huge Catholic presence in Stratford-upon-Avon and there's mm -hmm. things like you know, John Shakespeare and William Catesby shared illegal Catholic writings. They wound up in the attic of John Shakespeare's house in Stratford and nobody knows why they're there. They just show up and historians even debate how much John Shakespeare himself would have even known about them. And even just saying that out loud, you know, we're sitting here raising our eyebrows at, uh, how can you not know these illegal papers are in your attic, you know? And they go on to, to have other associations like with the Mermaid Tavern in London. William Shakespeare was said to have frequented there and this was one of the meeting spots for the gunpowder plotters. And so the question comes up with those things of, you know, how much sympathy did Shakespeare have for the Catholic plotters? Was he one of them? Was he just friends with them? Was he just wrong place, wrong time? But his family, his friends and connections definitely had these things going on. So the question comes up very prominently of how much was Shakespeare aware or not aware or, you know, it just seems impossible that he couldn't have had at least inklings of the fact that this plot was brewing. And I think mm -hmm. if we think that, how much more would someone like James I be thinking that, you know, who did I just patronize this guy? You know, I've brought him in here and I've made him my official company and now he's connected with mm -hmm. all these things. Yeah, I think he absolutely had to do something. And and putting on a play like Macbeth is a very ostentatious, clear way and really the right avenue considering theater's role of portraying current events in which to make that statement. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so so he's trying to clear his name in terms of his associations with people that were the plotters. He's trying to clear his name in terms of his uh, religious beliefs, what, what, whether uh, what he outwardly uh, professed uh, matched his uh, inner beliefs, we don't know, but uh, he wanted to make sure that there's no suspicion that he was a Catholic uh, based on uh, his family's connections or any suspicions thereof. Uh, so now, uh, since we're in this world where, where Protestantism is the, the uh, state religion, and uh, all the religions are uh, are banned. How does the paganism involved with uh, the the spells and the incantations at the three witches? Uh, how does that received by the audience? What are the three witches about? Well, I think they're there. I mean, I think there's a basis for James the first having a fascination with witches. So on face value, they're included because that was. I mean, I think a way to phrase it would be a pet project of James I. He had this established in Scotland and he brought it over with him to England. Um, and he was kind of dual minded about it. James was not only interested in finding what he considered to be real witches and prosecuting them for illegal activities, but he was equally invested in locating people who pretended to be witches falsely. And so I think them standing up and saying the things that they did was on the face value to appeal to James I. But also it's interesting to me, the idea of whether or not you can believe what they're saying, which. That's, that's a tricky question in and of itself because what the witches say isn't uh, always necessarily uh, the, the truth. But let, let's, let's put a, a pin in that for a second before we, we go into the, uh, the equivocal nature of the witches uh, speech. Uh, the witches themselves, um, how would the, the witch hunts of that era factor into the audience's reception of seeing witches on stage? Is that something, witches on stage or any kind of devils on stage, is that something that had been there uh, in other productions or is this a new, is this a novelty that Shakespeare is introducing here? I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a novelty really. I mean, I think they would have been aware of supernatural happenings they were all very real for shakespeare's lifetime and for many anything unexplainable got attributed to the supernatural and that included witches but it also included things like eclipses you know we have every reason to think that there you know there have been historians who dated back to when eclipses occurred and have found that there was an eclipse going on overhead of the globe when shakespeare's characters were calling them out so i think it's it's much more about kind of a, an association like they the, the witches play very significant roles and James the first would have been interested in them but I think as far as what the witches do on stage or what the understanding and relevance of the witches were for Shakespeare's audience mm -hmm. I don't think they would have been that different from the portrayal of witches on stage for today's audience in the sense that we know they exist we know they do magic and they're usually mm -hmm. cast as untrustworthy or evil and beyond that unless you're particularly well educated in witchcraft or the dark arts as they say in Harry Potter you're gonna mm -hmm. look for what they do and what they say on stage to determine what this character is or how much you can trust them and that gives Shakespeare some latitude to use the behavior of the witches to make a statement, which of course he does. And so the three witch sisters, as we mentioned, talk about Banquo's ancestors, followed by Banquo's son escaping the murder plot. And mm -hmm. I think it belongs in the conversation about the witches that there were established behaviors in the 16th and 17th century that suggested witchcraft specifically, as well as tests that you could perform to assess the presence of evil spirits or to test whether or not you could rid someone of the impact of evil spirits. There were even court cases from the 16th and 17th century where a person would accuse another person of being a witch and then they would actually perform theatrical acts of behavior to try and convince the court that this they were being impacted by witchcraft when it wasn't mm. real they were they were putting it on so there was already an established idea of witchcraft being theatrical in that sense so in that way it's actually very different from today because it would it's a slice of what was going on you know when you're mm -hmm. seeing this person be a witch on stage you may know about some person down the street from you that just went to court last week because they were accused of witchcraft you know so yeah, there's a big thing that you're mentioning it's very funny you say this uh i've always felt that his use of witchcraft uh considering 
personally, and, and, and Rodney and I spoke about this at, a, at another event, the, the Shakespeare's world was pervaded with the supernatural. Everyone believed there were ghosts. Everybody believed you went to hell or you went to heaven, that your, your spirit could be mobile. Everyone believed it so severely. That's why in so many of Shakespeare's plays, you have a ghost, you have some sort of, of darkness. Uh, Marlowe's Faustus played uh, the dark arts, if you will, like you'd see in any good old movie nowadays. There's the devil, there's Mephistopheles, you make the circle, you sell your soul, all of that. But in Macbeth, Shakespeare uses authenticity. As I said, we have three witches, the mother, the maid, the crone. Um, the incantations he used, if we, if we put any validity to the Shakespeare curse, uh, that some of the things he said were authentic. Do you think he feared for his life at all? Because if he knew so much about the dark arts, wouldn't he be afraid someone's gonna say, where the hell did you learn that? Pardon me. Oh, point. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think that that, I think that's very real. I mean, there was a line between, you know, you couldn't do it too well because if you, you know, if you use the the 16th and 17th century technology, we look to create special effects on stage. We look back at it and think, oh, that's a novelty thing because today we would do something like that with CGI. And we're like, how are they doing that mm -hmm. without computers? And we get impressed right. by their ingenuity. But for Shakespeare, portraying things like that on stage was probably just business as usual, how theater was done. And I think there was a line between, okay, this is what's acceptable for theater. But then if you get over here, here and it starts looking too real, you could be prosecuted for performing actual conjurations on stage if people thought what you portrayed would be too impossible to accomplish. Does that, you know, make sense? Right. And I, I, I right. think Ben Johnson actually did get prosecuted for this for a mask that he did where really? Jupiter is descending and there was some discussion at least about, you know, oh, that was too good. He had to have conjured <laughs> actual magic, you know? So probably for Shakespeare, he, he was following formulaic definitions of witchcraft to some extent because he didn't want people to think that it was real. You know, he wanted to maintain a little bit of that, you know, I'm, I'm pretending, I'm performing right now because if he went too far, he'd get arrested. Also, this is the, uh, in the midst of uh, outbreaks of the bubonic plague in England where uh, a large percentage of the population gets killed off, or gets quarantined to use uh, today's parlance, uh, would that impact people's perception of the witches as almost like a, a, a personification of the, uh, the, the, the taboo, the, 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 the plague carrying uh, evildoer of some, of some kind or, or something that's gonna contaminate them with their, with their uh, evil nature or with the, some kind of uh, quality they have? I, well, I think there's definitely overlap between witches being evil and evil being the cause of our problems. I don't know how much um, of that would have come. I, I don't know how much of that heaviness you can put into every portrayal of witches on stage. But okay. I, and, but there was a association. So. And there's something else that I find fascinating. I don't know if you've, you've come across this in your research, uh, Cassidy, is the idea that the trapdoor area in Shakespeare's stage where the witches and the other you know, ghosts and demons would emerge uh, is often re referred to as hell. Uh, would that mean anything for the audience watching that, uh, oh, the doors are open, the, the, this witch is emerging from hell? Is, is, would they have that, that fright? Would it give them that, that visceral scare that, that it's something like in a horror movie of today, you would see the, you know, the uh, Freddy or Jason, you know, something like that would have that equivalency for them? I think they would definitely understand that opening the door to hell and letting things out of it is terrifying. Yes. Okay. That's a very, okay. that's yeah. a very Protestant, that's a very Protestant mindset. I mean, hell is where the demons are and you're letting them into the world through that door. So I think it would have a visual connection for them in the terms of their religious beliefs. That began actually in the medieval periods when they did the pageant wagons and they would roll into town and basically do the cycle plays, they would have a trap door in the wagon and that is where uh, you might descend into hell or the, the devil would come out or whatever. So that's, that's an age old invention. And, and, and I'm glad it's still going because I think it's, uh, you know. <laughs> I was going to say the trap broke, door in theater it. has a long life. Exactly. Right. It's, it's a long history. Okay, so we were, we were I, I sidetracked us a little bit. We were uh, getting to the discussion of the, the prophecy of the witches and how it doesn't uh, quite uh, mean what, sh what Macbeth thinks it means. Why don't you talk to us a little bit, Cassidy, about the uh, equivocal nature of the witch's prophecy? There was a religious belief 
among Catholics that thought if you told a priest something in confession, then the priest was bound to not share that information with authorities. This was called equivocation, which is basically a right to lie to the government on religious grounds. And interestingly, the actual word equivocation is used in Shakespeare's Macbeth. Macbeth discovers too late that he must, quote, begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like the truth. That's in Act 5. And the use of the word equivocation wasn't just a common phrase or use of a, a word that Shakespeare threw in there. At this time, when the play was first staged, equivocation was a controversial idea in England. The concept was that Catholics were, lie, were allowed to lie in order to avoid incriminating themselves, and it wouldn't be considered lying in the eyes of God, which was more important than what the government thought of you, and that created controversy. The practice was one that meant a priest could avoid the sin of lying if he used ambiguous words or phrases. So if he led you to believe something else, or if he implied something that was untrue, he wasn't responsible for that. And in true Shakespeare fashion, the subtleties don't stop there. It's Macbeth himself who goes on to be brought down by equivocation. And he believes the three witch sisters are telling him he's safe from harm because they give him prophecies that seem <laughs> impossible. But then they say, you know, he'll never be vanquished until great Burnham would to hide Dunison. Hill shall come against him and that none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. It sounds like he can't die. And their implication is that he should live that way. So Macbeth goes on to act like it's true that he can't die, but then he discovers that equivocal deceptions must be doubted. And that actually has a real life basis from 1606, a man named, a priest named Henry Garnet um, was, tried for treason because he and he tried to use equivocation as his defense and they it didn't stand he ended up being convicted hanged drawn and quartered for his role in a plot against the king because equivocation was not like he knew about the gunpowder plot could have revealed it didn't and he said well equivocation i have equivocation and they said no no you don't and this happened hmm. This happened months, like th I think it's four months, March of 1606. So what is that? Four months after the gunpowder plot is when he was tried and this failed. So, and later that year, um, Shakespeare is staging Macbeth. So it's it's pretty, I mean, dead on current events with what's happening. And th this whole idea of, can you get off by equivocation is no. And Macbeth finds that out as Garnet did that you need to doubt what people say, so. Isn't that isn't that a dangerous thing for Shakespeare to? It's it's almost like playing with fire. If yes. if you're kind of putting it in a sense that that you're aligning the three witches with uh, whatever the outcast group is, whether it's pagans, whether it's Catholics, whether it's the plotters, whether it's whoever are the ones who are being the equivocators, are being the dishonest ones, who are being the ones that ultimately cause the downfall of the king. Uh, is is it wise for Shakespeare, as as wonderful as a theatrical device as it is, is it wise for Shakespeare to be playing with fire and and putting that in front of King James I, whose life was almost taken away? Well, it's got to be the shrewdest understanding of you know targeting your customer your or audience. your target right. target audience and and giving them what they want to see because the witches mm -hmm. are the bad guys and James already thought that. So when you're aligning the witches that are already established as the bad guys with the cultural bad guys in this plot yeah i mean that's the only place you could put them so it was pretty but smart on shakespeare's part what year did it's, shakespeare it's... retire i'm sorry what year did shakespeare retire when did he when did he stop writing plays um as far as i know that was 1613 when the globe burned down and that's when he essentially retired and and left london I attribute that to him, but this feels like a trap. No, not at all. No, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm thinking about what Rodney said about about really pushing the envelope, and I'm wondering if how long from the performance of Macbeth to Shakespeare's retirement, because maybe Whether that was no, that was a good maybe seven he did start years. That's seven. Okay. That's about seven years. Okay. Yeah. No, no there, there's still there's still a lot of content that. A lot that of life out. left, yeah. So, uh, so Cassidy, I, I, I apologize. Uh, before I, I paused you, I, I uh, derailed your train of thought. Uh, but, okay. but something that that's that's curious to me, and I don't know if you have anything you want to contribute about, is um, that uh, it, it's we're in a period of great flux uh, in Shakespeare's time, where where we're going from, as I mentioned before, the the end of the reign of 
Queen Elizabeth uh, the first of England, who was the revered monarch who everyone loved, who was the, the apex of society, to King James the first, the the king of uh, uh, arrival territory of Scotland, who now comes and combines the two kingdom, kingdoms into one. Uh, so is there um, in, in Elizabethan England, is there a holdover of people who are loyal to Elizabeth who are trepidatious about James the first and his new, uh, his new combination of the two lands? And would that factor into some kind of, of, uh, of, of tension or some kind of uh, um, something that, that factors into the, the workings of Macbeth here? I think Shakespeare, to me, yes, the country was worried about James coming in and, and what that was going to bring about. And they were rightfully a little worried about, is this going to go okay? I don't think... I don't think Shakespeare really wrote primarily for the audience. I think he wrote for the person who could influence his career. And that's something that kind of stays current for Shakespeare throughout his life. Even there is a difference between the place he writes. There is a difference between the place he writes under Elizabeth I and the ones he writes under James I. But this evolution of time here is Shakespeare really stays the same. He writes for his main audience which for i mean elizabeth I never actually patronized shakespeare she was hugely supportive of the arts and she did call shakespeare to perform plays but they the queen's men was its own company under elizabeth I, and shakespeare wasn't a part of that and actually when mm -hmm. shakespeare first arrives in in london or when we can place him there after his lost years the queen's men are arguably the most popular playing company in London and Shakespeare's company is coming in at a close second and then plague breaks out and basically decimates the Queen's men. And when they put it all back together, they take the best of the actors that are left to form the Lord Chamberlain's men as basically the premier playing company in England. There's reports of the Queen's men going around and performing at, at different places into the early 17th century, but the company itself never recovered to any measure of popularity that they had enjoyed before, and they were effectively dissolved. And the Lord Chamberlain's men were at the same time piecing together these crews and putting together the, the group of shareholders to start his new company. And they had a lot of strong business minds like James and Richard Burbage, combined with the talent of William Shakespeare and actors like Will Kemp. They really stepped up and, and just timely really to fill this void left by the queen's men. And it's obvious from their choice of plays along with their strategic avoidance of scandals and political turbulence, which plagued other companies that Shakespeare's company held pleasing the queen as a high priority. And Shakespeare's Lord Chamberlain's men were essentially solving a problem for the queen, which mm -hmm. makes Shakespeare a pretty shrewd person and a businessman first, I would think, because he's playing to Elizabeth's agenda and he continues through his company the original purpose she had laid out for the queen's men. So from an entrepreneurial perspective, this was a keen example of paying attention to your target audience and making sure you solve their problems with what you're good at. And he continues to do that under James I. By the time Shakespeare becomes the leader of the King's Men, he's achieved this high theater office in the nation. He's officially patronized by the highest position available is this huge honor and it speaks volumes about Shakespeare's progress and he continues to be Shakespeare though in that his work continues under James I with plays mm -hmm. like Macbeth to understand and deliver what his primary audience wants to see so I think Shakespeare stays the same but the person he's trying to please changes and that's why his work evolves I, I couldn't agree with you more Cassidy I, this is something I've, I've said frequently in my previous discussions with Jay and, and elsewhere is that I think Shakespeare is one of the finest examples, if not the finest example we have uh, in literature of someone who knows how to write for his audience, who knows how to give them what they want and do it in a way that is not limited to a certain segment of the audience, but that pleases everyone, that, that's, that people can interpret in whatever way best suits their interest. Uh, so I, I agree with you there. Uh, one more question before we, we uh, wind down the conversation. Uh, Cassidy is we, we've kind of connected uh, through some of the historical aspects. Uh, King James the First, for whom Shakespeare is ostensibly writing this play, 
to the character of Banquo, uh, with Banquo's uh, descendants uh, being kind of similar to James I. Uh, so who is Macbeth a stand-in for, if anyone? Jay, any thoughts? That's a really good question. Um, laugh at me, I never imagined Macbeth being the stand-in. I imagined <laughs> Lady Macbeth being the stand-in. For whom? You know, they say Shakespeare may have played Lady Macbeth the first night it was performed. There's an anecdotal I story. At I all surprised. That. Shakespeare is an actor that first, uh, depending on who you talk to, an actor only. Uh, but <laughs> Shakespeare, um, I, I, I don't know exactly who, but the way the character is written, her use of words, the ambiguous bit of her history when she talks of, uh, when Shakespeare says, uh, give birth only to male children, and, and I, I would take the, the, the boneless, I would take the, the, the child from my breast and bash it on the rock. You get the idea that there were children in that family. You get the idea that there is a history behind Lady Macbeth. And I have a feeling, and I don't know who it is, but that Shakespeare fashioned that character after somebody. Hmm. Um, it's my own opinion. It is in no history book anywhere, but I think it's his considering King James on the throne and considering Shakespeare uh, played to everyone, uh, it may be his version of Queen Elizabeth. That this is his little, you know, the powerful woman pushing the man into it. Uh, and, and so I get the idea that maybe he was, if not directly homaging her, I think he, he probably thought to himself, what would, what would Liz do? And what was the, this what was the, relation between uh, James I. I know that, that he was the closest blood relative, but I don't remember what their relationship was. Do you recall what's the relationship between uh, uh, Elizabeth I and James I? Uh, Cassidy, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think it was cordial. I think it was it was very businesslike. I think it was No, back but then. There, there's a blood relation. There, the, he's, Mary, he's Queen a, of, cousins. Mary Queen of Scott cousins, no? was James's mom. Yes. Mary, okay. Mary Stewart was James's mom. So that, that makes them uh, like second cousins or something like that. I forget exactly what kind of, yeah. I don't remember right. the number of cousin, but yes. <laughs> oh, right. some kind of cousin. Please, okay. I, I could never figure out second cousin thrice removed or anything like that, but I do. I, I, I don't know that for my own family, let alone for Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, really. Yeah. I think Mary, Queen of Scots, was Elizabeth's first cousin once removed, mm. and she yes. was James's mother. So whatever, so that I don't know. Okay genealogical okay, and, terms but yeah and they had a fraught history uh elizabeth I and uh, mary uh queen of scots so the fact that uh mary's son uh comes in as the new regent uh, after elizabeth's reign comes to an end is uh, yeah, a very yeah, dicey that's situation. wild that's wild that's to me very... because no mary kept trying to kill elizabeth right they and had then very... she goes hey would your son like to be king i i've right. never understood that yeah right that's a very very uh, uh that that i'm sure there there's a great film in there somewhere <laughs> Oh, there okay. is. Uh, there's a, a series now called The Spanish Queen, and it's talking about uh, Henry VIII's first wife. Uh, oh, and, that, that's and a great series, a, yes. There's a whole uh, 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 hypothesis, if you will, as you're starting to see uh, James's mother and, and the whole relationship to Scotland that England has. So, so yeah, one can see the foundations of the contentious behavior uh, between regions within that. Perhaps that'll be the basis of a future discussion. For sure. <laughs> okay, so sure. before we before we let uh, Cassidy off uh, for the evening, Cassidy, I'll, I want to ask you. We'll, we'll kind of loop back to the very beginning of our conversation tonight, which, in which we uh, talked about uh, in the current day in the U.S. at least, Macbeth is so deeply associated with Halloween. So, uh, why do you think that this play, this Macbeth, that was written in um, in many ways to appease uh, King James the First? In Shakespeare's day, to uh, to ameliorate the situation, to uh, uh, assuage any any doubts that that Shakespeare was loyal to his new king, to his new patron, that he wasn't a Catholic, uh, he was a, a true blue Protestant, that you know he wasn't associated with the plotters who tried to kill the king, all all that stuff, all all the ways to uh, alleviate himself of guilt. So, what about that that was written specifically for that audience in that time in response to the gunpowder plot? What makes Macbeth so enduring that we're still thinking about it and doing it so actively today? 
I love this question. I actually wonder if it has to do in terms of why we still celebrate Macbeth in association with Halloween today, if it does have to do with the original celebration of All Hallows' Eve and Hallow Mass and the fact that they celebrated that from October 31st through November 2nd, I think. And whether or not we've carried that on in the association because of the timing of when the play was first staged, I don't know, but I think that would be worth exploring. But to your second question of why is it so enduring, I think that it's enduring because he tells stories that are timeless stories. They're these tales of, of human stories and they don't really go out of style. I think the best um, description comes from actually The Prince's Bride, the film, when Peter Falk says, you know, the kid says, is it any good? And he replies, are you kidding? It's got fencing, fighting, chases, escape, <laughs> true love, miracles. You know, right. th these are the elements that make a good story. And these are the mm -hmm. elements of, of Shakespeare's plays. Shakespeare was also right. a master of social media. Uh, <laughs> the Shakespeare Macbeth curse. I dare either one of you to walk into a theater and say anything other than the Scottish play. Oh no. Uh, thank you. Oh, uh, you know, that's, that's something that we had intended to talk about that I totally overlooked. What, is there any historicity to, to, to the curse? The Shakespeare, Jay and I had this discussion previously and I don't think we ever resolved it. Is there, Jay was suggesting that, you know, based on some of the things he's read or he's heard, that there's some suggestion that Shakespeare himself dabbled in the occult and there, there's some curse connected to the play. Do you have any knowledge about oh that, Oh my Cassidy? goodness, I won't touch that one with a 10 foot pole, not a 10 foot <laughs> pole. No, I don't, I don't know about any from Shakespeare's lifetime. I know, I, I always thought that the curse on Macbeth was applied to people who performed Macbeth later because there were always disasters associated with performing the play. I didn't think it actually had to do with Shakespeare. I thought it had to do with these 20 people performed this play and somebody actually broke a leg in each of them. So, you know, we need to be worried about it now. Right. But then I don't there's, know how you know, it is, but supposedly Shakespeare dabbled in the arts enough. And when you look at the authenticity of his, his, uh, his otherworldly characters in that, uh, it had, it had been said that he, he either picked the wrong words so whenever someone does the play, there it, it awakens a curse or the witches for which he stole some of the material said, you are taking our material, fine. This is what's going to happen to you. <laughs> uh, ironically, okay. this is why I say about social media, uh, however it was fabricated, uh, Mr. Shakespeare may have sat there with Richard Burbage and his other producers at some point and just said, you know what? Let's say there's a curse. So everyone's going to come to the theater just to see who's going to die. It's, it's, it's a it was a thing. marketing ploy all along. The, the, the Broadway show Spider-Man, I bring this up for, for a reason, not just because a comic book. It's, um, uh, it was a terrible, terrible musical, uh, but everyone ran to see it because they yeah, heard that people true. kept falling. That the way that was the cursed. set was that mm -hmm. people would fall. And so everyone said, well, let's go see the show. Let's see if Spider-Man falls off the rafters tonight. And mm -hmm. I think by uttering Macbeth, everyone's, what's going to happen? So if you combine it with the fact that he summons up Hecate, there are the mother that made the crone, there are demons on that stage. They are making incantations and they're very graphic incantations. It's a bloody play. The ghosts come after him at the end of the play. And then just in case, the moment you go, bravo, Macbeth, a lighting instrument can fall on your head. Um, I have a feeling that that makes it that much more uh, 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 daring and, and, and appetizing to audiences, even to this day. Um, and, and, and hence the, the enduring connection, at least for modern audiences, with, the, with Halloween. Oh, uh, oh. There's, there's that, uh, there's that, that same uh, frisson, yeah. that, uh, that uh, almost enjoyable fear of, of uh, going to see the play to see if uh, you can somehow be connected to that that uh, that mystique that aura of of the uh, the bizarre of the, the, uh, the, uh, the haunted of the whatever it is so uh, it's a and we've very all said stuff. Macbeth so much at this point that we've got to go outside <laughs> turn around three times spit and spit. knock it <laughs> right okay well, that's fantastic all right well I think I think it's time for us to uh, let Cassidy uh, off the hook for tonight uh, Cassie, it's been such a delight chatting with you. Uh, and and uh, if people want to come and check you out, check out your website, check out your podcast. And, and you have a wonderful, one of my favorite, 
One of my favorite uh, ways to start every week on Monday mornings is that in my inbox, fresh and early, is a email update from Cassidy Cash that gives me the the scoop on what she's going to be talking about that week. Uh, so you can sign up for that uh, that email. It's fantastic. It's it's brief, but it's to the point. And it's a lot of fun. Cassidy, where can people find your information? Yes, go to CassidyCash.com is the best place to get to know us. And there's a stream up at the top where you can listen to episodes. And if you'd like to sign up for the email list, it's right there on the homepage as well. Excellent. And uh, your podcast is That Shakespeare Life. That Shakespeare Life, new episodes every Monday, available on iTunes, Google Play, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Okay. Well, I'm thank going you so there much, right Cassidy. after this. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, guys. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Cassidy. Right. Thank you well. Here. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Ciao. So did Shakespeare right. write this? Well, you know, uh, Jay, I, I don't know that there's any point to continuing this discussion. It seemed so uh, clear based on all, all the content we heard from Cassidy that Shakespeare was writing this play specifically to get himself out of trouble with King James I because his father and his mother and their relatives and their associates and everyone in their 80 foot vicinity was somehow related to something that could be treasonous or could be uh, a source of, of his downfall. So if Shakespeare is, is so deeply connected personally to this play and to James I, what question could there possibly be? Why wasn't he killed? Why wasn't he killed? Yeah. Uh, Shakespeare was very brave and very smart and uh, very adept at getting himself out of trouble. So in this case, he wrote, he fashioned a play in such a way that uh, he ameliorated the situation with James I, uh, removed the suspicion that he was a plotter. Uh, if he was a plotter, why wouldn't he rat out his, uh, his accomplices uh, let them burn, save himself. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's already in uh, so close with James I to the point where he's part of the king's men. He's uh, in the inner circle, so to speak. Uh, so th for him to, uh, to do anything that would uh, cause himself harm is, is uh, I mean, there, once you're in that, that well, what, ch choice, uh, what chance of being killed is there? Um, I'm thinking that Christopher Marlowe, when he did Faustus, Mm -hmm. uh, his play slapped the church in the face, but at the end, it is written as Othello is, as so many other plays are, where the anti-hero, if you will, Faustus, mm -hmm. repents completely and dies. He, he repents completely. And there we have the real movie horror effect in Faustus. We have the devil, we have the demons, we have the orgiastic hell scenes and things like that. Mm -hmm. now, Shakespeare, uh, do you think it was enough that he was just on the king's good side? He wrote a play that was downright pagan. It had to have been written by someone, whoever it may be, it had to have been written by someone who partook, who understood, who associated with the pagan arts. And back then, because of its connection, if you will, to Christianity, that put him in double jeopardy, not to mention another apocryphal play. But it put him into a problem. Now, would the king be so confident to just say, okay, Bill, no problem. Yeah, uh, it's, it's fine. You're, everything's fine. Nobody turned to Mr. Shakespeare. Nobody turned to the king and said, how did he know that there's three? How did he know it's three times three in pagan faith? How does he know about Hecate? Because even Hec Hecate is mentioned in Hamlet, uh, in Hecate's band, thrice, uh, I don't remember the exact line, but he mentions the goddess of the darkness, the goddess of the crossroads in his plays. He mentions three witches as in the mother that made the crone three times mm. three. He has these spells. Now, if it were me, if I were king and I saw two plays, one, Dr. Faustus, oh look, the devil comes up, he sells his soul. Okay, fine, I read that in church. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, this guy here is going right into the ancient myths, which I am supposedly against why wouldn't he at least for sake of his image prosecute William Shakespeare? Uh, let him, it, it happened to Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson uh, had right of clergy, but nonetheless, Ben Johnson was arrested. Why, mm -hmm. why not William Shakespeare at least brought on trial? 
oh, you know, I, I don't know that the fact that he puts the witches on stage in, shall we say, a, a very convincing format with, with incantations and with whatever, I don't think that's, that's something that would uh, suggest that it's not him that wrote it. I, I think it's, if anything, it's him, it's him selling the, uh, the product, you know, to the fullest, you know, it's, you know, I, I, you and I are both men of the theater and there's the maxim of, uh, of, uh, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, it's um, of uh, uh, play it to the fullest, you know, what, what's the, the, the uh, maximum uh, that you can ring out of uh, any given moment. And, and I think oh, cool. that he's, he's ringing the maximum out of it. You know, if you put witches on stage and, you know, they, you know, they have, uh, I don't know, they have the pointy hats and they have the, you know, the, uh, whatever they have a broom or whatever the, whatever the uh, contemporary uh, depiction of them was at that time, uh, then that's that's something. But you know, d- does that sell or does it sell better if they have a the you know the eye of a newt and the you know, the, the the leg of a frog you know whatever the uh, and the uh, and all that the the cauldron and the, bubble, the double double toilet and trouble. You know, I think that the more you put into it, the the more um, it's going to come. You know, it's almost like in today. You are are uh, very deeply uh, into horror films and things like that. You know, it's it's like if if you're gonna go today and uh, you know there was I don't know a few years back there was the that series of movies with the human centipede or something like that. Oh, and, yes. And 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 it's it's disgusting. But you know the the premise is that you know the guy uh, the horror in that movie is that he he surgically connects people together so that they they form one long uh, human centipede of sorts. So I, I don't know that the guy that made that has some great background in the art of uh, making people into centipedes. You know, I, I think it's just uh, you, you find something, you find what's going to make it uh, sell the most tickets, what's going to make it the most just outrageously gory uh, thing that people are just going to want to see because it's, it's just so crazy and it's so uh, out there that, uh, that he's, he's going to whatever level he can go to, to to draw that audience in. You're right. Nowadays, that's exactly right. But if someone penned the human centipede back in the days of William Shakespeare, they wouldn't be looked at as some sort of heretic for daring to make a, 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 a man, uh, to, make an, to make a bug out of a man. That's you know, part it's, of the thing with, with Frankenstein, actually. They talk about, you know, going against God's work. You know, so I, I think that, that there's, there's, um, there's different factors at play here. You know, it's, as we talked with, uh, at length with Cassidy about the idea that it's a Protestant society that is uh, avidly rejecting Catholicism and paganism. It doesn't mean that paganism is wiped out. It just means that, that it's being rejected. I mean, if you go around the world, you go to some of the countries around the world where, where there's ethnic minorities and there's you know, ethnic cleansing, so to speak, uh, and, and the majority is trying to take the, that ethnic minority and, and uh, either confine them to a limited area or to, to wipe them out, to slaughter them, whatever the case is, you know, there, there are those pockets. So the fact that, that someone in the majority has awareness of some of the practices of the minority isn't out of the realm of possibility. It's just, you know, it could be something very topical that, oh my gosh, did you hear that so-and-so uh, was a, a witch and uh, that they said this this incantation and they threw a, a frog, uh, the leg of a toad. And, you know, it's, it, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that this is something that would be uh, uh, present in everyday society. You know, if, if anything, it, it could be the manifestation of something that he uh, is seeing in, you know, uh, the, you know, the fears in day-to-day uh, England, you know, it's, you see, you know, the, you'll see it in, in New York City, uh, you and I, uh, you, you always see, you know, something outrageous in New York City that you wouldn't believe you could see, but you see it. And then, you know, then the next thing, you know, you turn on the TV and on Law and Order or on whatever the, the topical show is that it tries to bring the headlines to life or you know, that bring it into a dramatic format, you'll see that same crazy situation played out on screen. So it's, it's not uncommon to take something that's, that's out there in the situations ether. situations don't go against God. Nowadays, there are pagans. I know a lot of pagans in my life. Um, uh, nowadays, even, even now, if someone says, I'm a pagan, I'm a witch, everyone, really? Suddenly, the, the movie monster comes into their head and they think something's, some, some demonic force is going to happen. 
So an audience that couldn't stand to see two, a man and a woman kiss and pretend that they are in love, mm -hmm. enough so they had to have young boys do it, they're going to sit through something so um, realistic as that? Well, I mean, you also, it, yeah. you also have to look at, at what's happening elsewhere in, in uh, Shakespeare's era. In Shakespeare's era, the entertainment that, that he's competing with on stage to sell tickets for, to, uh, to, to find his audience for, is competing with bear baiting. They're competing with uh, dog fights. They're competing with uh, other things where people are literally being ripped apart on stage. You know, uh, it, and, and not just in a theatrical presentation. Uh, we, we were talking before about people being drawn and quartered. You know, the fact that people are, are literally in the public square being taken out, being uh, pulled apart to their death, being slaughtered, being hanged, being whatever the case might be. I think the fact that people are, that, that, uh, people are being uh, killed or put to justice in some kind of very dramatic, uh, gruesome, uh, gory way in a public setting is not uncommon for that environment. Certainly not, but you just didn't talk about the church. <laughs> you could have a, you could carry your head, you could carry someone's head into the middle of the square. You could set it aflame, but the moment you go hail Satan, now they're putting you in jail. Right. So right. my wonder is, why would the king associate with someone who would deal in such witchcraft, or at least depict it, if it wasn't someone that the king said, all right, let's just leave it be, because they are an earl, a duke, a lord, a ruler. If, because actors, actors back then, if they did something wrong, they were arrested. That's as simple as that. If, even if they, no matter who wrote it, why weren't they arrested? Why didn't somebody say, I don't want to look at this pagan uh, situation. Why wasn't someone arresting them? They were arrested for too much love scenes on stage, for saying something that might be salacious to the king somewhere. They're going to do this? A, a big question, actually, I was going to ask Cassidy. Uh, uh, maybe you could uh, illuminate. The coin mm -hmm. that, uh, that King James made. You, you know about that coin? Because I didn't the know anything about it. Right. That, that was really interesting. That was fascinating. Why mm -hmm. did he put a serpent on it? Oh, well, I guess the idea of the, you know, the uh, uh, pretend like you're one thing and really be another, you know, uh, uh, pretend like you are uh, kind and be the serpent underneath it, you know, that, that I, I think the fact that the, uh, these individuals that were the plotters were the serpents that were uh, underneath uh, King James's uh, feet and he, uh, he rooted them out. He rooted the serpents out. He stopped the plot uh, before it was caught. And I think uh, he to commemorate that, to make sure people know that he's got his eyes out on them, uh, that he's looking for the next serpent in the grass. Uh, he put that, that uh, coin out there to, to solidify that image. That's, that's really brilliant. Um, and uh, he was Scottish. And the whole notion of St. Valentine's Day, uh, was it St. Valentine? No, St. Patrick's Day, sorry. Uh, wrong St. Saint Patrick's Day, was that he drove the serpents out of Ireland. Hmm. So if we have this, the Scottish king, <laughs> oh, oh that, that just hit me for a moment there. Uh, if we have the Scottish king depicting a serpent like he's driving serpents out of England, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, so he understands the pagan mythology completely. He'd allow... Well, he has to. He has to allow because he's... Hecate? He, you know, uh, what Ca one of the things that Cassidy uh, mentioned during her uh, uh, section of the, the conversation was the fact that uh, James I was actively involved in his own uh, series of witch hunts. Uh, so if, you're, if you are putting on a play for someone who is uh, actively hunting down evildoers in whatever format that is, if it's a, a bank robber, if it's a, a witch, if it's a, you know, a murderer, if it's an adulterer, whatever the case is, uh, isn't it juicier? Isn't it uh, going to raise the heckles of the audience more if you see them in the act, if you see them uh, uh, in the flagrant violation of the, of the, the, the law? You know, if you're seeing the, the witches that King James I is hunting down and you see them on stage, it, it's, uh, it's boundary pushing. I agree with you. It's, it's dangerous. It's dangerous theater. But to see them in the act, uh, in flagrante, uh, I think the, 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 the phrase is, uh, it only makes the audience uh, more uh, more incensed that these witches are are guiding uh, the antihero, guiding Macbeth, 
or maybe in a way they're they're waiting for Macbeth's comeuppance because they're mm-hmm. waiting for Banquo, who's the stand-in for James the First, to finally uh, vanquish this this evildoer, this this usurper of the throne, and uh, and get his his uh, uh, what's what's coming to him for believing in these serpents in the grass and these in these uh, equivocators. So, in hearing what you're saying, either. Uh, uh, the the witches are with King James. That's not going to go over well, I think. Or uh, how do the witches die in Macbeth? I, do they die? I don't think they die. No, I they, think they don't live Macbeth. As as Kathleen they, they said, survive. I think this is a trap. Uh, <laughs> they don't die. Yeah, uh, they don't. They they, was, they outlive Macbeth. It was a tragical rule then that if you were an evil doer on stage. You mm-hmm. must die. That's why we have Othello, the brilliant Othello, die on stage because he did something wrong. That's why Romeo and Juliet die. As much as we'd love for them to go off and live happily ever after, they must die. Othello killed, and so he must be killed. Uh, here are three witches. Here is the epitome of what James wants to get rid of, and Shakespeare's letting them live. Enough so that they're even saying, Hail King. But Banquo, your sons, your son will be king. They're almost, pre- why are witches predicting the fate of King James? You know, it's, it's, it's a very good question, uh, Jay. And I think we, we kind of got stuck on this earlier where we don't have a clear answer for who Macbeth is a stand-in for. Right. And I think yeah, if yeah. we had that answer, that would inform the discussion. You know, but, but it, you know, as much as Macbeth is uh, a villain, he's also the hero of the story. I mean, uh, if you think of, uh, you know, in contemporary um, uh, analog to this, maybe, you know, something like The Sopranos. Uh, mm-hmm. Or something like that, where you know you have the 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 main character. Uh, as much as you despise him, as much as you know that he's a killer and he's a villain, and he's he's still the hero. He's still the the protagonist of the story. Uh, so you you want you want to see Tony Soprano, you know, caught by the police, but you also don't want to see him. you want to see Macbeth uh, stopped by uh, Banquo. You want to see him uh, get his comeuppance for for. Uh, slaughtering Macduff's family, but you know you, you also want him to prevail. And there's there's a few lines in there towards the end where Macbeth is uh, in his last uh, in his last uh, battles, where you have those those wonderful uh, little laughs with Macbeth as he vanquishes. You know the uh, you're not a woman born, and you're not a woman born, and he kills this guy and he kills that guy, and, and he has his last uh, hurrahs before uh, Macduff finally comes and uh, puts him out. I am untimely misery. ripped. <clears throat> right, right. Uh, so you know, I, as as much as we want to associate the the primary villain with uh, the witches, I don't think you can do that. I think that the witches, as evil as they are, and as much as they are uh, um, a dramatic um, agent uh, in which depict uh, s- someone that uh, James the First is hunting down. I think Macbeth, in in some way, even though he is uh, the hero, he's also the the he's the main hero and he's the main villain. You know, he's he's the the it, ultimately the catharsis of the play is seeing Macbeth get killed, is seeing Macbeth get his comeuppance, and and the fact that the witches work into that, uh, it might be it might have some deeper meaning in the sense that. If you follow the equivocators, the which is our equivocators, as noble as you may be, as powerful as you may be, as good a trajectory as you may have, if you follow the equivocators, if you go down that path, if you listen to the serpent, if you let the serpent pervert your uh, sense of morality, then you will also turn evil and you will also fall and you will get your comeuppance. You know, so I I, I don't know that that. Uh, you can it, the, the fact that in that scenario the witches stay on is almost a good thing it's almost a way that uh the 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 equivocators as much as we hate them they're still going to be there and as much as we're rooting out the serpents they're still going to be there you have to be uh you have to be cautious you have to have your eyes open you have to avoid the temptation to fall into their trap i, I called you brilliant at the beginning i'm calling you brilliant again uh something <laughs> something you had said you called you said the Scottish king, and it suddenly hit me, uh, uh, just as Moliere, uh, who was a, a carpet maker's son, who rose to such power and wrote 
and wrote all his plays making fun of the, the wealthy people who thought he was praising them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if this, whomever wrote it, uh, if this wasn't their little mm, at King James, if they were loyal to Queen Elizabeth, because when you think about it, it is witches that proclaim King James. If you go by the notion of Banquo's progeny, then it's mm -hmm. the witches who proclaim King James. So there's the co comeuppance number one. If he is so against witches, it seems the witches are the ones that are proclaiming him. His coin has a serpent on it, one of the leading symbols of witchcraft on that level, on malevolent witchcraft. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you think about uh, St. Patrick forcing the serpents out of Ireland, uh, here is a serpent who is for what serpent is being forced out of England, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that there's a curse on this, and what do we call this play now because of it? The Scottish play. Right. So is this, is this Shakespeare's way of saying, screw you, King James? I'm going to write oh, a play know. in which the demons proclaim you as king. So don't tell me you don't like witches because they're the ones that put you there, not royalty. Uh, and you want your serpent, there you are. Well, you are the serpent. And if Shakespeare was in proximity to the whole to the whole conspiracy, again, we see this whole thing where, okay, oh, hail King James, sure. And yet something else is happening there. And that's, that's, I love that. That's a fantastic point, Jay. And that's a really, really astute observation. And, and when you say that, it puts, you know, I've always loved Macbeth. I think it's a fantastic play. Oh, it's one but, of I think it's, but, but I never saw that angle in it. And now that you say that, it very much connects it to me, uh, for me to some of the other plays, you know, with with uh, Othello or with the uh, Taming of the Shrew or with, mm. or with Shylock, where you're not quite sure if Shakespeare is damning uh, Shylock uh, as you know the villainous Jew or if uh, he is sympathizing with Shylock. You're not quite sure if uh, if Othello is you know, uh, the evil, uh, you know, Moore, or if he is the sympathetic Moore, uh, perhaps. What's, a, what's case, the last line of Othello? Uh, he uh, loved too much or something like he, that. He loved know. wisely, but not too well. Something there you like go. He, and, too and wisely, what, but not well. And what's the most memorable of Shylock's uh, speeches? If you prick yeah. us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, right. do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? He says, mm -hmm. the villainy you teach me, I will... Uh, I will execute and it shall go hard, but I will better the, in, uh, the instruction. He's basically saying, if, if I screw you, then I'm in trouble. What happens when you screw me? You're right, Shakespeare is equalizing all of these villains. If you look at the Jew of Malta, Marlowe's Jew, Jew of Malta, and you look at uh, Merchant of Venice, you are totally seeing different. different Jews. Totally there's, different. There's a line I laughed out loud. I felt terrible. I saw production. I laughed so loud. They actually, it like stopped. Uh, there's one line where Barabbas, the Jew, turns to someone. Mm -hmm. Someone asks him a question. He says, well, what do you do? He says, well, I eat Christian babies. And oh, I goodness. just laughed so hard at that because it was so over the top. Um, right. I'm wondering whoever, uh, whoever wrote these plays, uh, if they weren't, a, and, this is, and this is basically the foundation of where it's coming from with me. Uh, someone had to be so brilliant to look at the political arena from a religious, cultural, political, financial standpoint and say, all right, I'm gonna make fun of you. How am I gonna make fun of you? I know, witches are gonna proclaim you king. So there's the irony because you're a witch hunter. And then we're going to have this character and they're gonna die, but the witches won't die. And then you, your serpent coin and all of that. And there are moments where I just know whoever wrote it is sitting there saying, okay, <laughs> and sitting in the back of the house going, oh, yes, yes, it's a tribute to you, your majesty. You know, I, that, that I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, whether you believe it's Shakespeare, you don't believe it's Shakespeare, that, that's, you know, we can, we can go deeper into that. But, but oh my God. certainly, who, the play as it's written, it's, uh, it's, it's brilliant in the way it works on so many levels and oh, how sure. whoever the audience uh, is can see it as being written to their favor. So I think that, and that maybe that's one of the reasons why it endures as strongly as it does, because it, it can be so many things to so many people. It, it also, and, and paganism is still here. Uh, it still is, yeah. People still, still uh, uh, worship those gods. And so even then, people, people prayed in silence. People prayed in, in uh, you know, behind closed doors. So when right. they saw the three witches on the stage, they were like, mm -hmm. 
I, I just talked about uh, uh, racism in, in one of my classes about musicals. And the point that was brought up, is we can no longer do it, but some of the, the what they thought was, was okay in the American theater at the turn of, into the 20th century uh, was not, but the, the positive point of it was, it opened up our minds to so many different cultures. We would not have seen mm. these cultures if we weren't permitted to, to laugh at them. So I'm right. wondering if Shakespeare didn't do right. the same thing and say, okay, I'm keeping the, the witches are still alive, wink. And they know that Banquo is going to give birth to the king, wink. Right, right. Yeah, that, that's, it's very daring. Absolutely, it's very daring. And I think that now, I, I hadn't thought of a lot of this before. And, and a lot of these, uh, these are really illuminating ideas that we're, we're bringing out in this discussion. And I think the next time I see the play, it's, it's really gonna be interesting to come back at with those eyes and, and uh, bring some of that new perspective to it. So that, that's I, I feel really the same way. I'm, discussion. I'm so thrilled that, uh, that you had Casey uh, come by because I didn't know, I, I know the play. I don't know the history of the time. So right. now when the next time I see it, I'm going to sit there and go, oh, I didn't really, oh, I see. And I'm going to catch things that I never caught before. Then I'm going to go rent V for Vendetta and I'm probably going to see things there. <laughs> I didn't see the first 12 times that I've watched it. <laughs> so next week we have Hamlet. Indeed. Our next episode is with Hamlet with our, our guest for that evening will be the very talented Ashley Griffin. So I look forward to that discussion. That'll be next week at the same time. Exactly. And something that's going to be live. We're, 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 exactly. We're going live for, for the first time. So this, this episode, uh, we're recording it on Zoom right now, but it will be yep. broadcast shortly after the recording ends yep. on uh, JMC TV, on New York Shakespeare. And that's we'll right. be sharing those uh, links. But we look forward to uh, live streaming next week with Ashley Griffin for Hamlet. That's terrific. She did... Uh, she did a, a, an out there production of it where Hamlet was a woman, but she was playing it as a man. Uh, the, the, she, was con she was convincing herself she was a man, but she knew she was a woman. And Ophelia was uh, a man, but he, because of, of the way he was bullied, he, uh, he thought of himself as a woman. It becomes this complete gender, uh, uh, gender ambiguity. So, uh, hmm. so I look forward to chatting with her about her thoughts on that. And, I look forward to it. Sounds exciting. Indeed. And, and maybe picking her brain uh, on, on my absolute favorite Shakespeare play of all time. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be just really happy to talk about Hamlet next week. I, th I think that makes both of us. I, I look Good. forward to it, Jay. It's been Good. a lot of fun. Thank you very yeah, much. Same the, here. the talented and insightful Jay Michaels. It's always a pleasure. And, and the brilliant Rodney Hakim. It is, it right, is you, forever a pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. All right. My well, it's been, it's been fantastic, and I look forward to doing it again next week. Indeed. Un until tomorrow. Be well. Have a good night. Ciao.